gostaria de agradecer a presença de todos a realizar a terceira sessão do Seminário de Estudos Medievais. Uh, sem mais demoras, porque estamos todos com, muita, com muito entusiasmo e interessados em ouvir a comunicação do professor, eu pedi à professora Maria João Branco que o apresentasse, que conhece muito bem o trabalho do David e fará uma apresentação mais fidedigna. Não vou ser muito formal nas apresentações, nem demorar muito tempo. Uh, vou dizer que o professor David Peterson tem uh, desenvolvido uma investigação uh, muito aprofundada e muito uh, uh, rigorosa sobre as ligações entre a apropriação do território e uh, o léxico uh, e a, a documentação que uh, preserva essa forma de, uh, no fundo, uh, dominar uh, o ambiente e as pessoas que nele estão. Uh, o professor David Peterson terminou o seu uh, doutoramento em 2006 com uma tese chamada Fronteira e Língua em El Alto Ebro, séculos 8 a 11. Uh, tinha antes feito um mestrado em comunicação um, uh, em computação, ou nós hoje chamaríamos de uh, humanidades digitais, uh, e fez uh, a sua licenciatura em Oxford em História. Uh, ele tem feito tem tido diversos projetos de investigação, aquele que eu conheço melhor e que é mais uh, espetacular sob o ponto de vista do utilizador é realmente a edição uh, digital do uh, Becerro de San Milan de la Cobola, que é uh, uma obra que recomendo a toda a gente precisamente porque dá essa dimensão de como é que um cartulário e um tombo pode uh, realmente uh, refletir uma apropriação do território e como é que nós podemos seguir uh, o percurso uh, formulado por um documento feito com uma determinada intencionalidade e aquilo que um, essa realidade nos reserva através da análise do léxico. Neste momento uh, julgo que estamos uh, a progredir para uma outra, uh, para uma outra uh, fase em que dos cartulários ao território, agora estamos do território à uh, realidade uh, e o David tem estado a desenvolver a investigação sobre, uh, no fundo, o reflexo na toponímia ou da toponímia uh, de realidades que a uh, ultrapassam uh, e, portanto, não estamos a lidar com os cartulários em si, estamos a lidar, estamos a partir da outra, uh, do outro suporte, por assim dizer, do suporte toponímico e partir do suporte toponímico para o suporte documental e do suporte documental para uh, uma certa realidade. E, e é fruto dessa investigação que ele está a desenvolver uh, e, e na qual se insere esta sua estadia de investigação uh, durante o mês de março aqui no Instituto de Estudos Medievais, instituto do qual ele é colaborador, membro colaborador, que uh, resulta esta comunicação uh, que ele hoje nos vem trazer e que vamos ouvir com muito agrado, uh, de R.A. a Santarém, uh, fazermos sentido, uh, ou tirar sentido da conquista islâmica da, uh, do nor noroeste da Península Ibérica. E, portanto, sem mais demoras, David, muito obrigada, uh, e nós vamos para a Platão. Obrigado. Obrigadíssimo. Uh, eu uh, queria falar em português, mas, uh, mas já me disse que será uh, I, I shouldn't so I speak in English because it's an international language. Before I start, I'd just like to thank uh, Mary Zhao and, and all the rest of the, um, of the team of the, the, the Instituto for the uh, wonderful, really, really warm, friendly uh, and supportive uh, welcome whilst I've been here in, in Lisbon. It seems to be very very um, friendly and, and happy environment to work in. So thank you. Thank you. Ricardo, Gonzalo, Mario, uh, Diana as well. Uh, everybody, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the 8th century, okay? And to explain this, uh, this uh, title, uh, this title comes from, uh, is inspired by this, this text, which is a, an Arab text, translated into Spanish by Pedro Charmeta, uh, Written originally, uh, this, this, these words supposedly written by Ibn Musayn uh, from Silvej, I believe, uh, in the 11th century, although we only have a later version of it. It, it's, uh, it has come through to us from the uh, Risala of Al-Ghassani in the 17th century. 
Okay, and this is uh, this is um, talking about what happened uh, when Spain, when the Iberian Peninsula was was conquered by the, the Muslim army in the year 711, 712. Okay, and there's this odd uh, odd phrase. It talks about the division amongst the victors, amongst the victorious soldiers, the division of the spoils, of the booty, and also the land. Okay. Generally speaking, this was following uh, the Muslim law. After a conquest, uh, four fifths of the uh, of the booty, of the spoils, were divided amongst the troops, and one fifth was set aside uh, for the state, for the for the Muslim state, for the for the community. Okay. And and in this text, it seems to be talking about this sort of division going on here. But he uses some very odd coordinates. Some other spatial coordinates, Santarén y Coimbra in the west, and Egea in the east. You obviously know where Santarén and Coimbra are. Egea is not a very well-known place. It's not, uh, it's not very famous in the 8th century or before or, or afterwards. It's not obvious why Egea is being used in this sense. So what I'm trying to do is understand the meaning of this phrase. And I'm going to do it through uh, using a register which is not very, not very fashionable. It used to be one of the basic uh, methodological tools for the early medievalist, uh, but in the last couple of generations it has fallen out of use. I'm talking about place names. And that's going to be the, um, uh, the, the, my, main, my main material that I'm going to use today. Okay, so this is the area we're talking about. So we're talking about the northwestern quarter of the Iberian Peninsula. And there I've, I've drawn a map, uh, I've drawn the line, more or less, that would be the frontier. Uh, separating Al Andalus from the northwest from about the year 750 onwards. Okay, I'm going to structure the talk uh, in these four epigraphes, uh, these four, um, four different sections. I'm going to start off talking about uh, place names as a methodological tool. Okay, uh, I've done some of the slides in Spanish, I thought it'd be easier, but I end up abandoning that, so 90% of it is in English eventually. Sorry about that, it's a bit inconsistent. Anyway, the first section, the first 15, 20 minutes is going to be about place names as a method methodological tool, arguing that we should make more use of them than we do. Then I'm going to look, <coughs> describe my uh, hypothesis, which I started off in, in my thesis, published, uh, uh, which, I, which, uh, which I defended 10 years ago, and, uh, and which I've and retake, I'm, I've gone back to that subject in the last couple of years. Okay? And my thesis is that uh, Quintana, a very common place name in all this area that I'm studying, uh, is a direct legacy of the uh, Muslim invasion. My study, which I did in 2006, uh, was lacking a part, a significant part of it. Uh, I understood that reference to Echea. I have a, a hypothesis which explains why they talk about Echea. What I didn't understand is uh, the significance of Santarem and Coimbra. So that's what I've been looking at whilst I've been here. I've been looking at the, the Portuguese aspects of this, uh, of this uh, sentence. And then the final part of the talk, uh, I'll, I'll try and address a few problems, methodological problems, chronological problems, and then open up uh, a debate, hopefully. Okay, so just we'll go back in, in, in history. A very traditional way of, uh, of studying uh, early medieval societies when we don't have very many written documents has always been place names. Well, I say it's always been. Traditionally, place names have been an absolutely vital uh, source material for, for the early medievalists. And that was the case uh, until a couple of generations ago. And this is just an example. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a map. Of, of the British Isles, as you can see, representing the uh, Scandinavian settlements, the Norse, the Nordic, the Vikings. Okay, and the one of the main tools for understanding the geography of the Viking settlements in in the British Isles was uh, place names. I mean, it's still that is still the case. I mean, a couple of um, Iberian quotes here. Uh, they're separated by seventy years. José Leite de Vasconcelos, I think that was from 1928, this quote, uh, saying that uh, nobody can doubt the importance of onomastics, and, and to a large extent he's talking about uh, place names as well as personal names here, the importance of onomastics for, uh, for the historian. 
And then 70 years later, a colleague of mine, uh, Ernesto Pastor, uh, expressing himself in very similar terms. Yes, there was no doubt. I mean, it is one of the fundamental tools for the early medievalist. Okay, so that should be where we are. But something odd has happened in the last uh, couple of generations. The International Medieval Congress in Leeds. I'm sure you've all heard of it. It's the most important, in quantitative terms, the most important uh, medieval congress in, in Europe, yes? Which every year brings together about 2,000 uh, historians. Uh, 2,000 historians and about 2,000 papers are given. Okay? And everybody has a right to, when, they, when you define your paper, uh, you, you give certain keywords, yes? Uh, and then there's an index of keywords, so you can, you, can, you can browse papers by keywords. So this is the index, this is a fragment of the index, and these are some of the different subject matters that are, that are talked about in Leeds. This is for this year, okay? Uh, so you can see how many papers talk about these different subjects, yes? And on the mastics, and this includes place names and personal names, for medieval history this year, but it's the same last year, and it'll be the same next year as well, on a massive just eight papers about it, okay? So we're way behind music or numismatics, not to talk about manuscripts or, or anything like that. We're, the only thing that there are more papers on anomastics than are is on dance. Okay, so we're, we're, we're slightly ahead of, uh, of the dance, but, uh, <laughs> but not by much. We'll be overtaken quite soon, I thought. Since only eight papers, we can actually have a look, see what those eight papers are. Okay? So in fact, there are eight, eight different papers, but three of them are in this one session. Okay? Another three are in the previous session. In fact, I think those two sessions are probably connected by the, by the codes. Okay? So really just three initiatives. And here we have a mix of personal names and, uh, and place names. We have a mix of periods as well. So very few people are really working on place names as an indicator of, uh, of early medieval history. Uh, this is basically the only one. And do we have internet here? Yes. And it's by somebody called David Peterson. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this really is a niche subject. It shouldn't be. I don't understand why. I don't understand how we've got to this situation. But nowadays, in uh, in medieval history, in early medieval, well, in any medieval history, it's it's uh, it's, it's barely used. This this, this registral I think uh, is important. I'm not saying it's easy to use. We're going to find, see lots of problems, and we're going to see lots of critiques of it, but it is very, very minority, very specialised. So if anybody wants to leave now, because what I'm talking about is, is uh, historiographically a bit irrelevant, uh, feel free to do so, I'm not going to be offended. Anyway. Here's a quote which I, which I found quite amusing. The study of place names is not a respectful occupation for a scholar. Um, it's been re-quoted by people who, who do work on place names, and the few people who, who do work on place names. Um, and by the way, um, a lot of philologists still work on place names. These are historians. At Leeds, you should be getting a mix of, of philologists and historians. We're not getting the sort of philologists who work on place names. You do have philologists still working on place names, and we're going to see some examples in the bibliography uh, later on. Okay? But mainstream historians don't, and archaeologists. Uh, certainly done. And there's sort of been a bit of a divorce between the two disciplines. So we don't get the philologists talking to the uh, archaeologists and the historians anymore. I think that's a shame. Okay, this is a bit of bibliography, just uh, so it's, it's available to you. Uh, quick, uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of uh, these, uh, these papers in the next, uh, next couple of minutes. Uh, one of the last people to seriously use uh, place names in Iberia uh, was uh, Angel Barrios uh, in the 80s. Uh, Garcia de Cortázar, obviously very important uh, historiographically. He was a great defender, still is a great defender of the use of, of place names, although he hasn't specifically uh, worked so much on them. Uh, but but he, he was one of the first people who was um, very clear about, about their importance, as you'll see from the quotes I'm going to bring up in a minute. Uh, my colleague from the um, Universidad del País Vasco, Ernesto Pastor, uh, who I've already quoted once. Uh, this is quite an important uh, book because it's, it's later re-quoted um, by some of the other people critiquing, uh, critiquing the use of places. They don't critique him, but they use his critique of others. Uh, Elizabeth Salora Rio, uh, who despite the name is, is I think, French, uh, is a um, very, very good title. It's Archaeology et Toponymie de Vos. Okay, just straight up, just from the title you know uh, what she's talking about. 
that's quite a, a significant uh, paper. Uh, and, then I, and then we can really kind of cite all, uh, the very few papers there are on this subject, uh, just, just on one page. Margarita Fernandez Mia, uh, writing 2006 as well, she started off doing a lot of work on, on place names and has sort of been dragged across to the, to the dark sides of the archaeology. Uh, and, and is one of these people trying to sort of um, make the two things match. And she's talking much more about uh, microtoponyms, the field levels and things like that, and they're used to, to archaeology. But she's sort of on the, on the defensive, trying to make a case uh, that there is still some possibility of, of using uh, place names. And then this article which I found, and I must, uh, uh, I must thank uh, Ricardo for this, uh, he, he found this article for me, uh, by uh, Maria Alice Fernandez and Esperanza Cardera, just as an example, that there are archaeologists working on these things. Okay? And I had a very, very, uh, very, very interesting and fruitful uh, conversation with, with Esperanza just this, just this morning. And in just an hour talking we, to each other, we explained things that we ever hadn't understood and we made a lot of progress trying to understand. And she's talking about Pintanus as well. And then uh, a forthcoming book by, by Leslie Abrahams, uh, which is a historical review of where it all went wrong and why. Uh, it has become so unfashionable now to, to work on place names. So I'm going to start with, um, with Leslie Abrahams, this, this article which is about to come out. And she's talking about the Scandinavian Viking place names, both in the British Isles and in Normandy. And one of the things she comments on, and this is, I think this is quite interesting, is how it became politically unfashionable to work on place names because of the um, sort of racist Aryan implications with the, uh, that some... Uh, people uh, read uh, or used or, or whatever. So, so, so it became unfashionable politically, not just historiographically. We've seen that historiographically it's, it's irrelevant now. And one reason behind that is that politically it stopped being, uh, it stopped being politically correct to, uh, to work on place names and, and on sort of uh, ethnic uh, distributions. Uh, And I think that's, that's quite relevant to what's happened in Spain as well. I think uh, we've had a, a, a change of generation, uh, and the uh, old scholars, uh, many of them right-wing, connected to the church, old ways of doing things, there's, there's been a, a change, and, and that type of scholarship has been, has been, um, has been rejected. Really. Okay. Another problem with place names is that they've been badly used by scholars. Okay, uh, simplistic interpretations, uh, concentrating on the anecdotal, uh, concentrating on, uh, on minorities and then from minorities uh, attempting to project uh, sort of majority conclusions. And this is where Ernesto Pastor, uh, and this is, a, this is a quote by Ernesto which has then been requoted by uh, Margarita Fernandez Mia and more recently by uh, André Marquez. Uh, in, their, in their sort of uh, state of the questions of, um, on place names. Pastor's not against the use of place names, but he's against the misuse of place names, sort of ideologically driven uh, use of certain types of place names to, uh, to sort of suggest that the, the Duero Basin was, was emp empty, uh, was, was a demographic desert in the, uh, in the 8th century, for example. The, the old uh, the old paradigm of Sancho Thalgorn. Okay, so that's what Pastor is, uh, is complaining about. Fernanda Mia also talks about uh, the inadequacy of place names. They can't really uh, answer a lot of our questions, but there are lots of intrinsic problems with place names. You, um, you don't know when the place name was created, that's a fundamental problem. You don't know if it's always been that name or whether it's changed over time. You don't know whether the, the actual place that is so named has moved. I mean, one spectacular example is Coimbra, for example, which has moved. But even within uh, sort of local communities, uh, sometimes uh, the community will, will move uh, from one hill, maybe maybe uh, a kilometre away, right, to a slightly different site. Uh, so place names and archaeology have had a very difficult time uh, sorting out what's happening. They don't coincide, place names and the sites that you think that they are reflecting. I mean, summing up Fadora uh, Riona with her idea of uh, this divorce, she's saying that after three quarters of a century of, of uh, symbiosis, uh, toponymy and archaeology uh, have taken uh, divergent trajectories. 
uh, and, the, and the use of, of, of place names as a substitute for archaeology, which was, uh, which was sort of proposed in the past, uh, now seems to her to be completely caduca. Uh, uh, it's, it's past its sell-by date. Okay, so there's no longer any, any relevance to that, that idea. Okay, so that's, a bit, that's sort of the, the critique that is made of, of uh, place names. They just don't work, they're difficult, they're unfashionable, uh, they've been badly used in the past, uh, and, and, and they really don't coincide with, with the archaeological uh, evidence that emerges. Still, I believe there is a, uh, there's potential in them, and I, I don't think we should be. There was an English phrase which is uh, throwing the baby out with the with the bathwater. Don't know if anybody can, can translate that for me. Yes, how is it in Portuguese? Deitar fora a criança junto com a água do banho. So there's no doubt that there are problems with uh, with place names. Methodologically, they're problematical. Okay, it's not easy. And we're going to see some of those problems. Okay, but I don't think we should be completely ignoring them as a potential. I read your stuff for studying, particularly the early men, um, uh, medieval people, uh, quoting Barrios and talking about possibilities, important possibilities of place names. I think this is still the case. Again, Pastor citing Garcia de Cortaza. Okay? And Garcia de Cortaza, I think, is right here when he talks about um, behind each place name there is a social project. Okay? We might not know immediately what it is, but there's some reason for calling something something. It is a historic a piece of data that we need to at least interrogate. I met more recently uh, Dawn Hadley, somebody again who works on the, on the Scandinavian settlements in England, uh, recognising that uh, the use of place names is challenging, it's not easy, it's not straightforward, it doesn't map straightforwardly onto, uh, onto the evidence that emerges from archaeology, uh, but nonetheless it is an important uh, source that we should be using. Okay, I'm now going to look at one case study, one use of, of place names in English historiography, which I think is, is very successful and which can illustrate what I'm going to try and do here today. In England, they have a thing called the English Place Name Society, which has been going for almost 100 years. It was founded in 1923. Uh, there were 68 um, monographs on different counties, generally, uh, more or less all following the same standardised methodology. Methodologies has evolved over the years, but basically they uh, they're all similar. So, so it's a huge corpus of, of material that historians can use and what we don't have in Spain. I don't know if you have it in Portugal or anything similar. Yeah. Obviously one person can't, uh, can't do that, but uh, anyway. That's what they have in England and, uh, and that allows them to generate studies and to generate the sorts of maps uh, we've been seeing. But people who normally work on these counter studies tend to be philologists rather than historians. But the project was initially was started by historians like Sir Frank Stenton, for example, early medieval Anglo-Saxon uh, historians. There were people interested in, the, in these place names. But now it's ended up completely controlled by philologists and historians really have forgotten about what was originally their, their project. In England, they also have the advantage of having the Doomsday Book, which is a phenomenal source, which is, uh, it has gaps, but, um, but basically for the year uh, 1086, you get a picture of all the, all the villages in, in England. Okay. Uh, it's a sort of uh, homogenous uh, overview of the country that we don't have in Spain, for example. Okay, in Spain you get one document about one place, well then about another uh, country that covers this area. It's very uneven. It's very difficult from fragmentary uh, information like that to generate any sort of overview uh, of place names, historical place names. So that's another advantage that they have with the Doomsday Book. And then the, and then the mythology that uh, is then used by historians using this material, it's very important to, uh, to try to use generic place names. Generic place names might be Quintana, for example, or different Quintanas, okay? Or uh, place names beginning with uh, Villa, and then with a second element, which you can then analyse. Or uh, in England with suffixes. Uh, the suffix ton would be an Anglo-Saxon suffix, the suffix by would be, would be a Viking suffix, okay? So you're studying groups of place names, rather than just studying the etymology of one given place name. Okay? You then make um, typological distinctions. Some, some uh, place names are uh, descriptive, topographical, others are habitational, uh, others are, are folk names. Those are the three main uh, classes of place names, traditionally. Okay? And you tend to be studying one or the other of those three. 
obviously, uh, cartography is fundamental to, uh, to place names. You, you plot your place names, you try to see patterns. Uh, but also topography, uh, because a two-dimensional map doesn't really tell you everything. Uh, and bear in mind that England is so much flatter, and particularly with, with the southern British Isles that we're talking about here, it's so much flatter than anywhere in Iberia. Uh, and even, even then, uh, you can't really understand the place names without understanding uh, the drainage of the land. Uh, even elevations, just sort of 10 meter elevation is a, to an Anglo-Saxon subsistence farmer is, is significant. Uh, whether it's facing south or north, uh, the type of soil, all these sorts of uh, factors need to be taken into account. So why you can't understand really what's happening. And I argue, I suggest that in Iberia this is even more the case with the, uh, such a dramatic uh, geography, orography. Then we've got to take on board that um, there are different uh, social linguistic dynamics uh, at stake. Okay? Uh, the classic example in, in England is to talk about the um, four invasions of the British Isles that took place during the, um, more or less during the, the first millennium after Christ. The, uh, the, the Roman invasion and the Norman invasion, a thousand years later, more or less, uh, are understood to have been basically elite invasions which had relatively little impact on the, on the, on the local uh, small level uh, place names. Okay. We have two invasions, the Anglo-Saxons from the 5th century onwards, and then the, um, then the Vikings in the 9th century, uh, seem to have a much more profound uh, effect on the place names. So the, uh, the inference is that uh, there was a massive displacement of population. Okay. So different types of interaction, the point is different types of social interaction and dynamics, particularly in conquest or, or colonisation uh, paradigms, have different effects. It's not, it's not homogenous. Okay. And then a specific example we're going to look at are uh, a thing called Grimson hybrids. A Grimson hybrid is hybrid in the sense that it has a Norse, a Viking, Scandinavian first name, Grim, would be an example, and, and an Anglo-Saxon suffix, Grim, Stun. Okay, there are two parts of the, of the, um, of the hybrid. Grim's B, with a Viking first name, a Scandinavian first name, and a Scandinavian second element isn't a hybrid, obviously, that's pure Scandinavian. And Alfredson or Alfriston is pure Anglo Saxon by, by contrast. Yeah? So you see that how Grimson is a hybrid. Okay. So here, we, we, we're, again, we, we're, we're talking about uh, maps of the British Isles and the different areas of Viking, uh, uh, Viking colonization. This is a map of the, the B suffix, okay, which is a purely Scandinavian form. Okay? And this is a map of the Grimston hybrids. Okay? The B suffix is almost entirely uh, restricted to the area known as the Danelaw, which is where we know there was a uh, uh, Viking settlement. Uh, the Grimston hybrids is, is, uh, is more dispersed, but it's interesting that in some of the Danelaw areas it's more intense. Uh, this one in the north is not so obvious, but certainly these two areas are further south. <coughs> okay, there are areas of, of significant Viking settlements, but here we're getting more Grimson hybrids. And the explanation for this, the traditional explanation, <coughs> is related to this text from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which talks about uh, how in the 870s, 880s, uh, when there was a, a, the first time there was a significant a Viking army wintering in, in England, uh, rather than just raiding parties. And when they conquered the land, they divided it up between them, between the, between the soldiers. Okay? And three different areas I mentioned. Northumbria, which requires one with a circle at the top, where it's not so obvious to contrast. Uh, but the two areas further south, Mercia and East Anglia. Okay? And the idea is a Grimston hybrid, it's got a, an Anglo-Saxon suffix. Okay? So the, so the hypothesis is that they are places that already existed when the Vikings arrived, and they were taken over by the Vikings. They were existing settlements. Okay, they're not new foundations. And in support of this is the fact that they are in, uh, tend to be in, in prime agricultural sites, because the Anglo-Saxons beforehand had already taken the best sites. Okay? And they are now being taken over by the Vikings. So there's a specific social dynamic going on here, which explains a certain type of, of place name. Right, so that's my example. That's more or less uh, our starting point. Now I'm going to talk about Iberia.
Quintana, which is a generic, uh, is a type of place name that was, uh, that was created essentially in just after 711. Okay? Um, because it's very trendy now, they said you have sort of an acronym, I've created an acronym for this hypothesis, which is Q711. Like, like CR7 sort of thing. Anyway, it's not, a, it's not a new hypothesis, okay? Here's a bibliography for it a bit. Uh, Jaime Oliver Sin is one of these people who's um, have been a bit of a sort of, um, been, been marginalized historiographically since, but he first uh, uh, proposed the idea that uh, Quintana could be a, a calc of the, of the Arab word Hums. Uh, Juan Fuzaya, who I'm sure many of you uh, knew, uh, talks up with great enthusiasm and then talks about it a lot, but uh, never really um, uh, advanced with it, I don't think. And then, uh, just when my thesis was coming out as well, uh, this author from uh, Salamanca was writing on a very similar thing, very similar uh, angle. Um, and then I talked about this in my thesis. Um, what I added, uh, so modestly, to, to all this debate is, um, above all, the, the ge geographical aspects of it. What I insist on, what, what I first noticed was um, the geography, which seems to me uh, to be quite exceptional. And um, as, as my Ejao said, my title of my thesis was uh, Frontera y Lengua en el Alto Ebro. So the Alto Ebro is, um, is this area. Yeah? And we got a very, very clear, and to me it seems not very natural, uh, frontier. I believe that something explains that. I don't know what. Uh, but something short. So this is the distribution of Quintana in Spain according to the, uh, the database of the Instituto Geográfico Nacional. Okay? This is just using uh, toponymia mayor, okay? just uh, settlement names, not field names, not, not field names. Okay? And this is the distribution. You can accept, I think, you're always going to get some exceptions. You're going to get some place names are copied, some place names are later foundations, some place names are, 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 are taken by a, a, a group which moved place and, and decide to, to refound the settlements. So the fact that you get some place names out of the core area I don't think is a problem really. And this is the core area, yes? And these are uh, sort of areas just on the limit of it. Thamora, for example, there's there only six in towns in Thamora, but they're all in the, in the northern portion of Thamora. Okay? These are the Spanish provinces, which I'm using as a as a default geographical uh, way of understanding the distribution. 98% of these Quintanas are in that northwestern quadrant. I say it's not even a quadrant, it's less than a sixth of the, of the peninsula. Obviously that's not very good way of representing this data, but that's, that's a lot more, more graphic, yes? This is the frontier that was that puzzled me when I started on my thesis. Uh, even within this area, there are places where there's higher concentration and a lower concentration. It tends not to appear so much in the, in the uplands, in the poorlands, in the hills. Okay? And, it's, and in Spain, it's almost entirely north of the River Duro. Okay? And of course, I'm lacking here any Portuguese data. So that was my starting point. Okay? And seeing that distribution, and then coming across these two texts, made me think that they could be uh, related. Okay? And as I said, it, it, was, a, it was an idea first uh, brought up by Oliver Sin, but to me the geography seems so, so striking. Okay? So the two, uh, the two Arab texts, one from Ibn Al-Qutuya in, in, the, in the 10th century, talking about uh, the, the division of Spain. He doesn't specif specify that it's from Northwest. Okay? Uh, but he does refer specifically to two things. He, he mentions uh, the quinta, uh, the extraction of the quinto, and then the, uh, some sort of relation to the ground as well, where you have the, the peasants, the, the native peasants, end up working uh, the land and being called quinteros. Okay? There's no other geographic context to this. But he does say it's the lowlands, which as we've seen coincides with, with what we see. And then the, the second text, which is referring essentially to the same phenomenon of, of, the, of, the, of what's happened after the conquest of Spain, uh, gives us these odd coordinates. Santarém and Coimbra on one side and Egea on the other. So how can we make sense of these, these coordinates? That's what I'm going to attempt to do. Uh, 
F here is about here. Okay, can you see the, the, the mouse? Yeah? And then you know where Coimbra is. Okay? So let's see what's, what a hair means in the, in the beginning of the 8th century. Uh, this is a study of the Roman uh, roads in Spain by uh, a colleague of mine, Isaac Moreno. Uh, the quality here is, is impossible. Uh, but uh, as interesting in the fact you can see the, the, the epigraph here, the title. So a hair is a significant point uh, in the Roman road system. And, uh, and essentially, the role it plays, it's halfway between Zaragoza, Cesar Augusta, sorry, and Pamplona, okay, which really are too significant. Much more significant than Eje, in fact, in the geography of, of um, late antiquity Spain. And Eje is here, okay? So it's actually on the point where two different road systems emerge, and it's sort of halfway, it's on the way from Zaragoza uh, to Pamplona. What I understand is the significance of Ejea and why it's cited when it's, otherwise it is not a significant place in the, in the Arab geographies of the conquest. They tend to talk of, um, of Zaragoza, Pamplona, Bambaluna, uh, Amaya, oddly, Astorga, uh, and then places further south. But in the north, that's basically all you get. And this reference to Ejea is it's, it's unique, and this is the sense I make of it. And it's, it's quite significant to my thesis. We know it in 711, uh, when the Muslim invasion takes place, according to the chronicles, uh, Rodrigo was, uh, was on campaign against the Vascones, somewhere near Pamplona, presumably. Yes, and then came south. We also know that um, after 711, when the, um, when the Muslims are armies are spreading out across the peninsula, uh, they head from the central peninsula, they head uh, northeast initially towards Zaragoza and then Barcelona, and then they turn around and they go up the, the Duro Valley, they go through Zaragoza again, and they head up towards uh, Amaya and Astorga and the Galicia. Okay? We don't know the route, uh, the exact route, but uh, obviously, uh, well, it's obviously they're going along the, the Ebro Valley. Uh, and Echea is one of the, um, is a potential key point for their gone past. And, we also know that when they got to the area of southern Navarre and the Rioja, uh, the local commander, who was a, a late Visigothic count called uh, Cassius, Cassio, uh, he surrendered. He didn't fight. He converted to Islam. He ended up going back to Damascus with, with Mutha uh, as a convert, and then, and then, he, and then he, he maintained his, his, his territory in southern Navarre and in the Rioja. Those are two areas that are associated uh, with his dynasty, which comes later, which are called the Banu Kasi. And it's one of the two most significant uh, examples of, uh, of regional pacts in Spain after the uh, Muslim invasion. We have one thing put me in, in Murcia. Okay? So, yes, yeah, so the so, uh, Kasi is, is, is a known uh, figure. Uh, so my hypothesis is that Ejea would have been the point where the Muslim army advancing from Zaragoza towards the northwest first came across uh, Casio uh, and perhaps was his headquarters, his military headquarters. And then metonymically, metonymically uh, they apply it here to the area controlled by, uh, by Casio. That's, that's a bit of a, a shot in the dark, but uh, that's, that's the sense I make of what Echea is. I can't think of any other sense. So Echea is describing the territory controlled by Cassio, which is the south of Navarre and the Rioja. Okay. So if we look at what the border, we know around the year 1000, we have a document which describes the border between uh, Navarre and the Rioja, uh, between Navarre and Castile. Navarre becomes uh, Navarra Rioja, which is this area here. And then on the other side, on the Castilian side, is where all the Quintanas appear. Okay? That's quite impressive of that scale. These are, this is the toponymia, these are the, the um, settlement names from the, from the uh, Instituto Geográfico Nacional Database. Yeah? Um, but for the Rioja, we can actually go, go down to microtoponymic level, because well, we have a, a very uh, useful source by Antonino González Blanco, a dictionary of, of all the place names, just of the Rioja. And the, what is now the, the provincial border between the Rioja and Burgos, 
is this black line here, which doesn't coincide with a historical border between the two kingdoms. Don't ask me why, it's too complicated. But anyway, it's about five kilometers difference. Okay? And that five kilometers is where all bar one, there's always one, all bar one of the Quintanas in the Rioja appear. Okay? So even at this microtoponymical level, you're getting a very, very, I would say, artificial distribution, which, which I think needs explaining. So let's recap a bit. So I'm claiming that Echea means the Rioja and Southern Navarre. Okay? And as we've seen, Quintana maps very well uh, to the eastern limit of Castile. Okay? Two other points, two other points of order before we progress. And they're very important points. I can't really uh, develop them now, but we we'll maybe talk about them uh, later if need be. One significant point we understand that the invaders spoke Latin and Berber and not Arabic. Okay, they're Muslim invaders, but they've only very recently been, they're North Africans, they're not Arabs, they're from the Maghreb, they've only recently themselves been conquered, they've been very superficially Islamicized, they've maybe taken Islamic personal names and a sort of superficial notion of uh, religious conversion, but they, they don't speak Arab. Okay? And we also know that in the pre-Islamic period in North Africa, uh, the, the local polities that existed uh, tend to be very wide-ranging, uh, geographically wide-ranging. Uh, a lot of nomad groups were, were involved in them, but they also was a very intensively um, Christianized. Uh, the, the northern coast of North Africa is very in intensely Christianized and, and, and Latinized. Okay, and the and the polities uh, that emerge in late antiquity in, in North Africa seem to have brought together different groups. Okay, and uh, a good example is, is this uh, epigraph referring to Masuna as the Rex Gentium Maurorum et Romanarum. Okay, he's the king of both. His, his kingdom, his uh, confederacy brought together these different people. And the argument by experts on the matter is that the, the lingua franca, the language that held these groups together, was Latin. I'm not suggesting that the, that the troops who, who occupied the peninsula were fluent in Latin, but I'm saying they would have had some exposure to it and that when they found themselves uh, interacting with Romance-speaking natives, they would have used uh, Latin. So that's one point. The other point is that Quintana in Castile and in Leon uh, appears fossilized as a place name from the very first documents that we have. Okay? Uh, I've, I've uh, produced here uh, Castilian examples, which are a bit later from the Leonese one, but uh, I, I know the Castilian material better. Uh, but just some examples. Uh, right from the beginning of the 10th century, which is when we started having Castilian documentation, Quintana is already a place name. It's not a common uh, lexical item. You do get some examples of its use as a common lexical item, but to, to find one, I've had to go to Leon to find it. So here you do have an example from Leon. I'm sorry, it's down at the bottom, but, I, uh, but it doesn't help my argument, so I don't think you mind if you can't see it. <laughs> So it does exist, okay? It can exist as a lexical usage. But most of the time, in Castile certainly, where we're seeing all these uh, modern Quintanas, in Castile it is already a place name in the 10th century. <coughs> and I can prove this. Oh no, sorry. I'm going to come back to that later. I'll prove it later. Okay. So we're going to do another, another brief recap before we, we move on to, to the Portuguese uh, evidence. Okay. So, what do we make of Quintana, of all those methodological problems we're talking about place names, or what, what are disaster place names are, they're impossible to use, archaeologists that want to know things about them, all that sort of thing. Quintana is not going to be exempt from these problems, and we're going to see that there are problems, and we're going to see them in detail in, in a bit. Uh, and I've already mentioned, uh, it is polysemic in the sense that sometimes it's a place name and sometimes it's, it's, it's common uh, lexical item. Okay? But it does have the um, very important saving grace, but it is etymologically, etymologically transparent. Okay, you don't have to really, really work very hard to to identify it or, or to work out uh, its, uh, its its development. And as we've seen, it's got a very specific geography, which I think is an important point in its in its favour as a historical source. It's not diffuse. It's much. It's much more. Uh, 
I've forgotten English. Do we say knitted? We don't say knitted in English, do we? Knitted. It's much clearer, much more obvious uh, geography than we've seen with the Grimson Hybrids, for example. They're much more diffuse, and, and yet they, are, they have been sort of central part of, of English historiography. Also, we're not actually claiming, uh, with my, this hypothesis, that they are foundations. We're not saying these places were founded in the 8th century. What we're saying is there was some social dynamic, and it could be the 8th, it could be the 9th, it could be the 10th, I don't care to a certain extent when it was, but there must be some social dynamic that explains why all these places in a very specific geography are all called in the same way. It might be a fiscal dynamic, I don't know. It might be administrative. It might be religious, I don't know. But uh, there should be something that explains And they are documented relatively early. Okay? So this is sort of my starting point when I arrived here a few weeks ago. See what happens in Portugal. That border we've seen in the Rioja, see if we can replicate it in, in, in Portugal. That's really what happened. So, anyway. Which is why uh, I come to this, uh, this page. Yes? So I started looking. I went to Maria Rao, suggested I uh, have a look at the um, Portuguese army uh, SIG uh, page. So that's what we did. And, uh, and this is the geography. Okay, so you look for Quintan, uh, and it comes. You get 205 initial hits. Okay, you only get Quintan. You don't get Quintana, for example. You put Quintana and then Asterix, but uh, uh, okay. But anyway, that's, that's that's a useful geography. Uh, very much in the north. Very interesting, but Travers Montes is for absolutely nothing. Uh, sort of dying out in the middle, and then this very odd uh, little concentration down in the south. Okay, so that's a, that's a first step. But we want to work in the, um, but it's not very user-friendly, it's interface in it. And we want to work in the Kintellas as well to get, a, to get an overall view. Okay, so what I did was, um, I, I did se separate searches for uh, uh, Quinta, Quintella, uh, various other forms as well, I brought them all together. Uh, I tried to weed out all the different, there were some duplicates we worked in. Okay, so here we have a very good example. We've got a place called Quintella das Lapas, and then we got a hill next to it called Alto de Quintana das Lattes. That's really just one appearance, yeah? So we, we eliminate that sort of duplication. And, uh, and then I'm working on the basis and I've mapped them according to the parish for there. Okay? So on the map we're going to see a continuation of the names that appear of the parish names. Because if I put the Quintana names in it, it'll just be all exactly the same. There's be no point, okay? And here we're working with different types of... Um, of place name, okay? Uh, Paul, I, I can't actually find a, a legend, a key to, <laughs> to uh, what, what these terms are. Paul clearly means a Polora, I assume. Cass seems to be a smaller uh, settlement. Uh, Rib is uh, referring to rivers, etc., etc. And Mont is also, and uh, Monte here, yeah, okay? Anyway, we're, we're using different types of, of, of place name, okay? So we're mixing, it might, methodologically might be a bit of a problem, but anyway. We'll see what happens. And this is the distribution we get. Okay, and these are the numbers. So we end up having 270 in all. Okay? We've got 136 quintas, and I include the plurals. I don't distinguish between plurals and, and singular. So quintas, quintana, uh, quintales. We also get quintals, which I didn't really understand at first. I've had that explained to me today by, by the philologists. Uh, and then quintella, which is the equivalent of, of quintanilla in, uh, in Castillo. Okay, so that's a distribution. Again, it's not really the best way to represent such data. So I put it back into, into Google Earth. Okay? At this scale, obviously Google Earth doesn't really work very well, but it gives, you, it gives you a general idea of the geography. But the good thing about Google Earth is you can zoom in okay, to, to, the, to the level you want. Uh, so we find this first. Uh, idiosyncrasy. Uh, idiosyncrasy. Uh, in, in the Algarve. Okay? This is very interesting. It was, uh, in, when we saw the, the map earlier of Spain, we get isolated uh, cases in southern Spain, but just one or two per province. Uh, there's nothing like this in, in any other part of Spain outside the northwest quadrant. So this is, we'll come back to this in a minute. What I didn't realise then, and uh, Ricardo is, is uh, guilty of this, is that there was an article already done about this uh, just a couple of years ago, and uh, Ricardo found the article, and it's got some lovely maps. I'm going to use these maps as well as my own. My own, uh, you can zoom on them, so they, they have their, their advantages. Uh, it's very interesting to talk to these people today and see what their take on, on, on the distribution was, and more or less how distributions do, do coincide. 
uh, there are some, uh, some very interesting uh, points of contrast as well. And uh, it's interesting that the um, philologists were working on the, they were only working on Portuguese data, and they were working in terms of uh, reconquest geography, and they're sort of trying to draw different bands uh, across Portugal and, and thinking in terms of progression. It didn't really work very well, because they're getting the same forms generally, with one exception, they tend to get the same forms across the different bands. Okay, so I don't really see what the band, the, 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 these different bands, moments of conflict, uh, will help you. Obviously, the, the main concentration is always going to be up in the north, yes? But beyond that, it's, it's not clear how the reconquest paradigm helps to explain this geography, I don't think. Okay, but anyway, we we'll insert some to our map so we can done this one. Not that not really but it has been done over the last minute. Or we could do the same with the, with the Google Earth one, it looks a little bit better. Really. But you get the idea, yeah? Okay? The, as I said, the Nursula Algarve concentration is, is unique. There's nothing else in the, in the south of the, of the peninsula. And in general, the, uh, the Portuguese concentration is, uh, gets a lot further south than, than anywhere in Spain as well. But then again, Sands End is quite um, a lot further south than, than here, so that's what our source is telling us. This is the central area. This is the area that really uh, interests me. And again, you can zoom in, but I think you can uh, perceive uh, that there is a, a sort of a line here, which we can talk about as being some sort of a frontier. Bear in mind that um, poor areas don't tend to have quintanas, so even within areas heavily Quintana uh, infested areas, you get you get, you get uh, deserts, but they really die out by the time you get to the Sevilla Estrella, and of course, and Coimbra just down here, just just to the south of this map. And there's another represent, representation. I mean, I would argue that uh, the one in Cernache and Marsella and Rio Maior, both near Santarém, are just exceptions of the sort that we're seeing in in, in southern Spain as well. I think that the, the real limit is, is this one. We go from uh, Monte Mayor of Bello over towards uh, Guarda. So what does this limit indicate? I mean, what, what does it mean? How, how can we understand it? What is it? Is it? Does it reflect the conquest? Does it reflect the reconquest? As, um, as Cardeira and Fernandez uh, uh, explored that possibility. Yeah? Or, or could it just be some other uh, phenomenon that we haven't really um, thought of? Okay, I mean, we can't be sure, but it's one or the other. And it, anyway, is it necessarily all the same phenomenon? Is it one? Is it necessarily just one phenomenon? Or can we have diachronic processes working here? So this is the um, repeating. This is uh, Fernandez and Candeira, I think conditioned by uh, Portuguese historiography. In fact, they were just working on the Portuguese material and seeing a heavy concentration in the north and then less further south. We're thinking in terms of uh, uh, of reconquest. I think it's important not to to be um, to think that your hypothesis, your starting point, is the only possible uh, solution. Okay. Is it necessarily another question? Is it necessarily the same phenomenon in Castile as in Portugal? I mean, I was assuming it was at the start. Okay. But in Castile, right from the very first moment, it is used as a place name. It's fossilised as a place name from the 10th century onwards. And then, and, and this is where I can prove it, because I can't do a whole talk for an hour without talking about the Bethesda Valley down at the land. So, uh, so this is the, the edition that uh, Maria Zhao was talking about earlier, and it allows us to do searches on the whole corpus. So we can put in a string, in this case Quintan, and it will bring up both place names and sort of normal lexical usage. And in this area, which is, which is exactly the limit between the Rioja and Castile, uh, it's always a place name. That's what I was saying earlier. That's why I had to go to Leon to find an example of, of it being common lexical usage. Okay? So that's the case in Castile. From the 10th century onwards, it is just a place name. It's not really in, in common usage. And that is different to what we're seeing in, in Portugal. In Portugal, I start up looking at the um, Sensual de Lobispo Pedro, late 11th century, which names 500 different parishes. And I got very depressed last week when I saw that, um, uh, that only two of them, or really one of them, uh, actually has the name Quintana. 
Okay, so just one out of 500, that didn't seem to be a very good return for that. <laughs> uh, and it's, it's this one, uh, Santo Beresmo de, de Quintanella. Okay. And even worse, when you look at the, uh, I can't pronounce this word, Inquirijon. Uh, when you look at the Inquirijos, you see that it is actually a lexical term that's being used in the 13th century. It is a place name sometimes, but it's also people are buying, selling, trading, dividing, uh, bequeathing uh, Quintanas. Okay? So it's not just a place name. So maybe, maybe the Portuguese Quintanas are a later phenomenon and they're not the same as Castile. So that's where I was a, a few days ago. So then, you look at the, um, these are the, the 255 parishes in which Quintana appears. Okay, so these are the modern Quintanas. So these are areas with a propensity to have Quintanas in them. And even then, you don't really get Quintana. Quintana doesn't work as a parish name. They're, they're sub-parish units. Okay? And it makes a bit of sense, because if everywhere it's called the same, then, it's, uh, then there's no point. I mean, uh, place names don't work in that way. They have to sort of uh, identify. So when it is used as a name, it's uh, in some way like uh, Quintela de Lampata, I think is in Tazos Montes, where you get very few uh, Quintelas. So there, it does serve as an identifier. But somewhere where every village has, some, has a hill or, or an old settlement called Quintela, uh, it, it can't be solidified. That one exception from the, uh, from the Fensoise, uh, a name I can't say. Santo Veresmo de Quintanella, the only parish in the whole of the Sensual really called uh, Quintanella, because Quintinian is a very dubious uh, example. Santo Veresmo de Quintanella is, not, is no longer called that the parish, it's changed name. It, it became Santo Veresmo de Serra and is now San Julio de Pathos. Obviously, Quintanella just is, is not a very good name for, for a parish. Okay, so maybe we shouldn't be too worried about the absence of, of uh, Quintana, Quintella from, uh, from the Fensoir, because it's not in modern parishes. And nobody's denying that there are modern, hundreds of modern Quintanellas. Okay, so the fact that it doesn't appear in the parishes in the 11th century doesn't mean it doesn't exist in the 11th century. Okay. I mean, another, so I began to think, okay, so maybe in the 13th century it is still alive, they are still creating and naming. Uh, uh, Quintanas, but maybe there's a, another, maybe there are two different strata. Maybe there's an early strata and uh, a stratum and, and a later one. So let's work on that a possibility. And using uh, Avalin da Costa's edition of the Sensual and reading through the notes, you do see some early references to uh, Quintana. Okay? Not very many. Uh, but then again, there's, I understand there's not so much uh, early documentation in, in Portugal as, as, as in Castile. Is that the case? I think so, yeah? No, anyway. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Anyway, there are some examples, okay? And it is clearly here, it is a place name in all these examples. We're all, all earlier than the Sensual. Okay? And you notice they're all, actually, they're all of them, they're Quintanella. None of these are, are Quintana, or Quintan, or Quintal. Okay? And that's very interesting because um, one of the things uh, that. Uh, uh, Pierre first talked about this, uh, about the chronology of different types of, of diminutives. Okay? And how the diminutives in Ella, the sort of more Latinate uh, diminutives, gradually became superseded by the diminutives in, uh, uh, in Inya, typical Portuguese. Yes? So going back to his article that I've mentioned a couple of times already, they talk about this. Okay? And they, 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 they talk in terms, uh, they apply it to. Uh, in general terms, this is the general chronology of a shift in, in, in type of, of diminutive. And they're saying that uh, in the 11th century, for example, north of the river uh, Duro, it's basically about 50-50. Okay? As you get further south, and you're assuming that they are later, chronologically later, uh, the foundations, uh, then uh, then the Inya form uh, starts to predominate in the 60-70%. Okay? By the time you uh, the 12th century, in the Lower Mondego and the, and the uh, Beda Baixa, uh, it's about 80% of the forms are in Inya. And then down in, in, in the Algarve, which understood to be 13th century uh, names of places, uh, it's up to 90%. Okay? So the indication is that the Ella forms are earlier. 
Okay? And the absolute dominance of the eliforms that we see amongst the Quintana family suggests that it is an earlier uh, substrate. Okay? Two other points from this article. And this, this worried me greatly when I, when I first read it. Uh, they said many of the, um, of the um, well, you can all read Portuguese better than I can, uh, but, but they're saying that there's interference, or at least potential interference between Quintana, between Quinta and Quinta. Okay? Uh, because uh, people might have, uh, because uh, semantically they're not that far removed anyway, and because of a uh, phonetic proximity, and also because of a tendency in certain times. Uh, to lose the, um, uh, the intervocal, uh, the nasality, uh, this tendency could be happening. It's invisible, but it's a, it's a possibility, it's something to take into account. But what we are studying as uh, the map of the Quintanas might be missing a lot of information. So that's a problem that we have with Quintana. Quintana. But we don't have it with Quintella, because Quintella is not, in its form, it's not so close to any other form, it's less susceptible. So that sort of distortion. So these are two arguments in favour of forgetting about Quintana for now and studying Quintella. And the third argument is that uh, Quintao is a dialectal form. Uh, its origins are in the far north, in the uh, Minyota. Okay? Now this is very interesting when we look at these, uh, these odd the uh, concentration of places in the Algarve and in the uh, lower Alentejo. Okay? Quintao in the north is a minority form, and here it's 50% of all the forms. And this uh, they analyse in terms of, this is where their repopulation uh, paradigm does work. Okay? They're suggesting that the, that the Algarve forms are in fact a 13th century uh, creation of known uh, movement of population from the northeast uh, down to the uh, northwest down to the, to the southeast, which is what this map three represents. This is for their work. Yeah. And then map four is when they got rid of the Quintans, they got rid of the Quintaos, and they've just got the uh, Quintella. And Quintella is intrinsically an older form, and it is less uh, less prone to contamination by this confusion with Quintana. So maybe it's a, it's a more promising a raw material to be studying, the geography of the Quintella rather than all the others. So my methodology of, of mixing them all together was, was flawed. I made a mistake there. Anyway. So this is basically uh, where we've got to, and I'm going to leave it here. Uh, and I'm going to use this map. I, I borrowed this map from uh, Candeira and Fernandez now. Uh, the geography from F here to Coimbra is working. With this sort of map, it works even better. You don't get any exceptions south of, the, uh, south of Coimbra. Okay? Looking at this as a whole, the Quintana family, uh, which, which I sort of uh, forced together, we, yeah, we might as well be talking about sort of, um, sort of uh, different phenomena at different times. Okay? With particularly two possible moments of uh, fecundity, two periods in which uh, we can see creation of, of place names. Uh, quite possibly uh, in the 13th century, in the 12th, 13th century, uh, the, the use of it as, as lexical commune, as, as normal vocabulary in the Inkili shells, maybe that is, is also creating place names in the 13th century. And that might explain some of the density uh, of, of the place names in the far north. But an earlier, there seems to be an earlier substrate as well. Okay? We can't say it's 7 Eleven, although we do have those interesting texts which, which, which nudge us towards it. But anyway, before. Uh, these later coinages, I think there's an earlier uh, substrate. And then we see this uh, 13th century uh, repoblacion, uh, which would explain the Mertola cluster. So anyway, as I said at the beginning, nobody said that uh, toponyms are going to be easy to use, but, uh, but I think uh, there is promise there, and I think it's worth the exercise. Uh, I still haven't answered this question, so I'll leave that up to you. Uh, why, why they join together Santelem and Coimbra, what it means. Uh, and then what we have to study later on is if it is a conquest phenomenon, what is the specific conquest dynamic? The fact that the Quintellas in this case avoid the poor areas and the uplands, I think makes sense. When you are when you are the conquest, when you've won, 
you take the best lands, you're not going to, not going to take the poorest lands. And that goes in, in uh, against one of the sort of the cliches about uh, the Berbers. Okay, they, they were sent up to the northwest of the peninsula, okay, to the more marginalized, colder lands, inferior lands. But within the northwest, were they really, really going to then go into the mountains of the northwest, or were they going to take the prime sites in the northwest? And I think, I think the uh, second. And then the other problem is it's, it's just very, very atomized. It's sub-parish level, all these places. If they really are from the 8th century, so what are we talking about? So we're talking about uh, one village being given to a, a warrior, and then one sort of farm on the outskirts of the village being a kin teller in the sense of the produce from that farm goes to the state. It seems a very atomized way of organizing. It seems very hard work to, to keep control of all that. So I'm not claiming I, I understand all of the dynamics. And I'll leave it there. So thank you very much. Sorry if I've overrun, which I would have done. Thank you very much.